And good morning. Welcome to the Grace Hour. And we say good morning with some conviction today because we're back in the mornings. And we've, uh, after years of being in an afternoon time slot here in the eastern part of the U.S., Grace Hour, our online outreach has moved to this time, 11 a.m. And we'll continue at this time uh, for as long as God leads us to be at this time. So we invite you to be a part of the program today. I'm Pastor Steve Andrelonis. Uh, Pastor John Love is here with me. Uh, we're launching uh, a new theme this week, new topic. We're going to talk about the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, uh, you know, this is the season, uh, the second half of the Lenten season, uh, according to traditional churches. And uh, we are approaching Easter Sunday, which is April 17. And of course, uh, this is a great time for us to talk about all that Jesus said and did, and this uh, climactic part of his public ministry is about to be celebrated and uh, talked about in detail. And uh, one of the things we want to focus on this week is uh, one of the great pieces of teaching, uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And if you read the New Testament from the beginning, this is really the first extensive piece of teaching that we have recorded for us by Jesus. So this is in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And uh, we know at the beginning of Matthew, we get the genealogy of Jesus. We get an account of how he was born. We get an account of how Herod and others reacted to his arrival. Uh, we get Jesus getting baptized by John the Baptist. And then we have Jesus with a showdown with his enemy, Satan, in the wilderness. And then after that, we have this uh, exchange. Uh, well, this actually, I guess, lecture? What's the right word? It's a sermon. Jesus delivers a sermon, and it's uh, on a hill uh, around Jerusalem, and uh, thousands of people came out to hear what he was saying. And uh, we want to look at this. We're going to unpack some things this week uh, from uh, there's a lot of pieces to this, and uh, Jesus has a lot to say, and it's really foundational, foundational Christian doctrine, because it comes from the lips of Christ, as recorded by his apostle, Matthew. And Matthew was a tax collector, so he was good with details, and we have a lot of details in uh, his gospel. So it's awesome uh, to listen to what, uh, to listen and talk about what um, Jesus says in these passages. So Pastor Love is going to launch this week's um, teaching and uh, this week's subject uh, with something from the Sermon on the Mount. Pastor Love. Thank you, Pastor Steve. And yes, it, this is uh, historical, isn't it, as far as the radio ministry of both Telephone Time and the Grace Hour is concerned. Um, years ago, of course, uh, Grace Hour and uh, telephone time broadcasting at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And then, of course, for a number of years, we were in the afternoon at 1 p.m., and here we are at 11 a.m. So it, it really is uh, unique, and we hope that many of you have stayed with us and will continue to join us live. And for those of you that are unable to listen to us live, we hope you'll continue to listen to the broadcast as you can archive it at your convenience. But great to be here uh, with a new week of broadcasts and Great to be here in the morning. It's uh, it's different, but I know we'll get accustomed to it. We hope that you will, too. So the Sermon on the Mount. And before we begin, uh, le let me start by saying, um, when I first came to know Christ, when I was born again, and that was the summer of, I almost hate to date it, but the summer of 1973, that's when um, those who were sharing the gospel with me um, led me to uh, a place where I was ready to receive Christ. And they spoke a lot about what it meant to be born again. And I was fascinated by that and never had heard that before. I grew up in a, a uh, I think, a fairly religious home and family. Uh, but in the denomination that I was a part of for my most of my young life, um, I never heard anything quite like that. I never heard Jesus say those words. I never heard anybody quote him in a actual church building saying, you must be born again. If you're going to enter into the kingdom of God, you must be born again. So having understood that and the pre-salvation work of the Holy Spirit bringing me to a place where I was ready to 
invite Christ into my heart and accept him as my savior, I made that decision. And I'm so grateful. God was actively drawing me and something in me knew I just had to respond if I were going to receive the gift of eternal life, be cleansed of my sins forever, and have the assurance in my heart that when I leave this world, I'm going into the very presence of God. And it would all be because of his grace. So after having received Christ as my Savior, of course, I was encouraged by those who were discipling me to get in the Bible, to study the scriptures, to begin to read the Word of God. And like so many new believers, I began in the New Testament. I did not open up in the book of Genesis and start there, although I was familiar with those passages. I wanted to read what the New Testament was all about. After all, Christ was my Savior. I wanted to know what he had to say, and I wanted to hear what his promises were to me personally. And of course, I began in the book of Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament, the first book of the New Testament, and then I, I got to the Sermon on the Mount. And Pastor Steve, I have to say that when, when I started to read it, I found some troublesome passages, such as, <laughs> be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, I had to stop there for a moment and say, this is going to be a problem, because I knew at that time I was far from perfect. And I thought to myself, well, you know, I thought I just needed to be born again. What does Jesus mean in this Sermon on the Mount when he said, be ye perfect? And then I continued to read, and then I ran into some other troublesome passages, such as I, God said through Jesus that I would be forgiven in the measure that I forgave others. And in the measure that I withhold that forgiveness from others would be the measure that God would hold, withhold his forgiveness from me. And again, I found myself troubled. Why is that? I thought that my forgiveness was a gift. I thought that I was forgiven on the basis of what Christ finished on the cross. So again, I found myself troubled. I continued to read, and again, I was more troubled. Jesus said, accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I thought to myself, well, I don't know if my righteousness exceeds the scribes and the Pharisees. What was their righteousness? How can I compare myself to it? And after all, I was told in the New Testament epistles that I had the righteousness of Christ, that it was imputed to me on the basis of faith alone. Again, I was more troubled. And this trouble just continued as I just kept reading through the Sermon on the Mount. And then I began to realize in the Sermon on the Mount, over 100 verses, think about this, there is not one mention of faith. Think about that. Not one mention of faith. All right. How about the Holy Spirit? There is not one mention of the Holy Spirit and his life-changing ministry in our lives as believers in the church age. All right. What about the finished work of Christ? There's no mention of his finished work. There's no mention of the cross. There's no mention of his atoning work. Well, then let me search the Sermon on the Mount and look for this all-important phrase that Paul the Apostle refers to almost a hundred times in his epistles, in Christ. I'm sure I'll find it there. I didn't, and you won't either. So you can imagine I was conflicted. I was troubled. I thought to myself, Am I saved by grace through faith? And by the way, there is no mention of saving faith as a means of bringing you and I into this grace that saves us, keeps us, teaches us how to live godly lives. So I began to study and realized, now wait a minute, the Sermon on the Mount, that first teaching, as Pastor Steve brought out, this is the first major teaching of Christ. And remember, it is prior to the onset of the church age. This is, for all practical intents and purposes, what Jesus is describing here are kingdom teachings. Those teachings 
that will govern and guide those who are alive on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. And there's no question about the fact that every principle that Jesus brings out in the Sermon on the Mount is restated in the epistles of Paul, in the epistles of Peter, in the Johannian epistles. So we're not suggesting that what Jesus said was irrelevant or impractical or not applicable to our lives. On the contrary, all of it is. But we have to understand these teachings in the context of who we are in Christ. Because again, imagine how troubled you would be if someone said to you, trust Christ as your Savior, you'll be eternally secure, your sins will be forgiven. Because think about it, Jesus did say that God will forgive you of your sins in the measure that you forgive others of their sins. Now that sounds like a seeming contradiction to what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, when he said, be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for the sake of Christ, has forgiven you. That's New Testament forgiveness. You see, God's not going to withhold his forgiveness from us because we aren't forgiving others. Now, practically speaking, what happens when we withhold forgiveness from others? Well, we frustrate the grace of God in our lives. How, what a contradiction that is, that God could forgive us our mountain of sin, but we cannot forgive others of their molehill of sin? It just doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the incentive and the motivation to forgive others is found in the forgiveness that God has given to you and I. And therefore, yes, we don't withhold because we would be, well, we'd become prisoners. We would frustrate the grace of God. We, we would, actually, we would allow bitterness to come into our souls by harboring the forgiveness that we should be giving out so freely just as God has so freely given it to you and I. Yes, these teachings, uh, I think sometimes unsaved people could pick up the Bible and say, and I've heard this said before, I love what Jesus said. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. And I think unsaved people could take these spiritual principles and say, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm trying to do that with the hope that if I'm able to follow these instructions, that that will gain me acceptance in the sight of God. Friends, it won't. You will find yourself on the treadmill of human works, and you will be at it for a lifetime and fail to recognize that all of your efforts and all of our efforts always fall short of the glory of God. Why? Because we're sinners by nature, and we're sinners by choice, and without being born of the Spirit, you and I cannot know God. We cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, practically speaking, are those that are poor in spirit blessed? Absolutely. You say, how do you know? Well, James chapter 2, verse 5, again, a New Testament epistle, tells us that you know, God enriches those who are poor in spirit. Now think about that. What does he mean by that? Well, it doesn't mean that God places this high commodity on those that are poverty-stricken, because the poverty-stricken soul that God is looking for is one who recognizes that they are poverty-stricken in their hearts, poverty-stricken in their spirit. And without that poverty-stricken nature, they cannot recognize the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God, the love of God. And blessed are those who mourn. They'll be comforted. Yes, when we recognize our sinful condition in the sight of God, I think that does cause us to mourn. I think we do recognize how much trouble we're in. And again, it brings us to a place that the Holy Spirit would like to bring every human being to, to recognize their need for a Savior, and to find the comfort and the rest that only Jesus can give us. The meek, well, 
There's a great principle in the Psalms, in Psalm 25. God says the meek he can teach. We have to ask ourselves this question. Do we have a teachable spirit? Is there something in us that's entreatable, that will recognize the Spirit of God speaking to our hearts, and will we respond to that? Again, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, couldn't we say that that's someone who in their heart may be seeking God, may be asking all of those questions about life? Where did I come from? Where will I go when I leave this world? What's going to happen to me at the point of death? Do I have an exit strategy as I prepare to leave this life and step across the threshold into eternity? Well, God says those who have that desire in their hearts, they shall be filled. And then there are the merciful. Blessed are the merciful. They'll obtain mercy. I know it does sound like that it starts with us. In other words, unless we're merciful, we won't be able to obtain mercy. No, for you and I, God who is rich in mercy, he has saved us by that mercy. And now those mercies for each one of us that are born of God, they are new every single morning. And God loads us up with his mercies, and then we distribute those mercies. Verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Well, what a great principle that is. As God by faith purifies our hearts, we get a deeper understanding, a deeper revelation of who God is. We see him more clearly because the Spirit of God has enlightened us, opened our eyes. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Yes, peace is something that Christ has given us because of what? Justification by faith. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, We have peace with God. And when peace is found in our hearts and we have it through the finished work of Christ, guess what? You and I become peacemakers. And they are called the sons of God. Yes, we're called the sons of God by faith in Christ, which has given us peace with God and allows us to be peacemakers with men. Then in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Yes, that's the truth. Persecution for the believer in this church age is inevitable. And it's also incidental. We know that persecution will come. And it's because of the fact that we are now a part of the body of Jesus Christ. Jesus put it this way. If they hated me, they will hate you. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Oh, we could sidestep that persecution and attempt to retain our personal reputations, or we could take that reputation, place it on the altar, and count it a privilege to share in the persecution of who Christ is. What a blessing that is. He went on to say, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Friends, has that happened to you as a born-again believer? It's happened to many of us, and yet We recover from it. We get through it because we know it's part and parcel of our lives as believers here on the earth. Yes, every single principle found in the Sermon on the Mount is restated, if you will, in all of the New Testament epistles under the teachings of the grace of God. So no, you won't find faith mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount. You won't find the Holy Spirit mentioned because the Holy Spirit, of course, did not come until Pentecost, when the church age officially began. You won't find any mention of the finished work of Christ, because up to this point, Christ has not even spoken of his going to the cross. And of course, that amazing phrase, in Christ, we won't see that till later in the New Testament, in the Pauline epistles. So someone might ask the question, well, then why this sermon? Because Jesus was setting the table. In fact, remember, he is speaking to scribes, Pharisees, people who are trusting in themselves and trusting in their own righteousness. And what he was doing was taking the Old Testament law and actually elevating it to a place 
where people would have to look at it, listen to it, and say, that's impossible. And that's when Jesus would say, that's right. And that's why I came, to go to the cross and to do for you what you could not do for yourselves, to die in your place, to become the substitute for your sins, to atone for every single one of them. Yeah, he did say that. He even said, well, you've heard it said of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. I could imagine some self-righteous scribes and Pharisees thinking to themselves, that's right. That's what the law says, and we haven't done it. And then Jesus took it up to another level and said, but I say unto you, if you even look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery. Wow. (laughs) What was he doing? Bringing every single human being to a place where they realize, I can't do this. I could never adhere to all of these principles found in the Sermon on the Mount. Why is Jesus saying these things? To bring us to a place where we realize, where we recognize, I need a Savior. I need someone to come and rescue me. Because if he doesn't rescue me, I think I'll be lost forever. And that's why as we continue to read in the New Testament, we come to John's Gospel, we hear Jesus say these words to Nicodemus. You must be born again. And that's the best message that any of us could ever hear in our lives. Because he didn't say that it would be a good idea if you were born again. Or have you ever considered being born again? He said, you must be born again if you're going to enter into the kingdom of God. And then, friends, we begin to realize that once we're born again, all of those principles that we find and we read about in the Sermon on the Mount, we can experience them. We can live according to those principles. Why? Because now we've found our acceptance before God. Now we realize that our relationship is based upon faith through grace. Now we have the Holy Spirit living within us and sealing us until the day of the physical redemption of our bodies. Now we recognize that the work is finished. Now we realize we're in Christ. Father, we pray that you'd bless these thoughts today as we get started on this week of looking at these amazing principles found in the Sermon on the Mount. Use them to encourage our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's the opening portion from Pastor Love today here on the Grace Hour. You're listening to us live. We're coming to you from our studio in Baltimore at our new time, 11 a.m. It's about 23 minutes after 11 right now. Uh, We just want to remind you that this will be our usual time, our regular time, Monday through Friday. Uh, If you miss, uh, the Grace Hour archives will be available on several platforms for you, uh, including, uh, first and foremost, uh, gracehour.org. That's our website. Uh, You can go there. And also you can go to YouTube and Facebook. Uh, These things are there. Uh, for you to watch again and again, and also look on Apple, Spotify, and Amazon, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Audible, Google Podcast, and Stitcher. You can find us in those places, and uh, that's the way we'll be uh, progressing. Hopefully, you can join us live uh, in the morning. Uh, hopefully, this is working out in your schedule. And uh, we just heard Pastor Love break down uh, what is the Sermon on the Mount for, and what why would Jesus start this way? Well, it's certainly not a marketing strategy. Not when you start off, blessed are the poor. <laughs> That's not a way to launch a marketing strategy or to um, establish some sort of brand name for your um, new product. That's not what Jesus is doing here. Really, it's, uh, it, it's uh, like Pastor Love said, this is a kingdom teaching. What will the kingdom of God look like? Not like anything presently on earth, or previously on earth, or anything that may come in the future on earth. It is a a kingdom that is ruled and reigned by the Son of God, who has fulfilled all the law. Maybe that's the great comfort in the midst of this. Later on, as you read through Matthew 5, you see Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill every bit of the law, and that in my fulfillment, uh, I would make a way for salvation. 
Uh, so thanks uh, for being a part of our program today. And uh, you could call us at 1-800-338-7060. That's a toll-free number in North America. If you're outside of North America, anywhere in the world, or you're here locally in Baltimore, please use this number, 410-483-3700. Of course, the number of you have already posted uh, some of your comments, the short, pithy kind of things. Thank you for your encouragement. And we'll take any questions or comments that you post there. Uh, like uh, Murakara has said, brilliant teacher, my brilliant teaching by Pastor Love, as he has done uh, since I was in Bible college. Well done. Uh, somebody watching Ashley in Indiana, uh, Ruth in El Salvador. And uh, really, just thank you. Uh, thank you for um, uh, listening to us and being a part of the program today on the Grace Hour. So. Pastor Love, I had one thing I just think like when you read these things and you get, like you said, you get into the Sermon on the Mount as you did after you were a believer in 73, uh, the temptation is to try and fashion a formula. We yeah. all want to please God. Exactly. That's really like we both came out of traditional churches and we knew what it meant to please God to, you know, to sort of pay so that we could play, that kind of thing. And that's the temptation. You listen to this and you want, you're looking for activity and like how, you know, what's the way of God? And uh, we can, you know, and Jesus is saying something completely different. Yeah, no question about it. Because uh, it, it, just think of the Beatitudes, you know, all he is saying there is, you know, you're blessed, you're blessed, you're blessed. But there isn't any mention of salvation in that. No. Right? He doesn't no. say if you do these things, you will find yourself inheriting eternal life. He just says you'll be blessed. You'll be blessed. I mean, I think we have to remind ourselves, too, that when Jesus came in his first advent, in his ministry began, it was heralded by John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's ministry was directed towards the nation of Israel, saying to them, you know, this is, I'm here to prepare the way for the Messiah. And he was the herald of the king that was to come. Christ was the king. So all of Israel is anticipating and expecting the Messiah and no doubt the establishment mm. of the kingdom. Yeah. This is what they were looking for. This is what they were told was coming. And Jesus early on in his ministry authenticated the fact that he was indeed the Messiah and he laid the groundwork for the coming kingdom. Mm. But again, as we pointed out, there's no, 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 no thought of faith, no, no mention of the Holy Spirit, no finished work, no in Christ, none of that. That would come later in the second of the major teachings of Christ, which would be the upper room discourse. That's right. There yeah. he would begin to speak of the church and the Holy Spirit, which would come later and what it meant to the disciples as they anticipate, anticipated becoming members of the house of Israel to becoming the body of Christ. So, I mean, it's, it's, I think this is why rightly dividing the word of truth is so important. Mm -hmm. Studying the scriptures diligently and, and searching them daily is so vital and important because without it, you could be pretty confused. I yeah. mean, can you imagine a believer hearing when, when they accepted Christ, your sins are forgiven. And then they open up to the Sermon on the Mount and say, wait a minute. Uh, you know, <laughs> and they think to themselves, I've harbored some unforgiveness towards someone. Does that mean that God has withheld his forgiveness from me? I mean, it can be troubling. It's true. It's true. And I think when we look at the Bible, we have to understand that we are looking at a collection of literature uh, that is of different categories we have the Psalms, the praises, the Proverbs, those pieces of writing, they serve us in a certain way. They speak to our heart in a certain way. And then we have these pieces of history. And now, yes, you know, let's seek for the historical Jesus. That was a, I remember that book in that series that was like very um, secular driven, like we're looking for Jesus as a, uh, as a documentarian. We want to document, we want to see the reality of who he is, and it's a reality that's not really guided by the Spirit. And then when we look at the way that Jesus is presented here in Matthew, who he is as the 
son of Abraham, the son of David, and then how he was born as a via the Virgin Mary, and then now his teaching. Like you're right, he's coming first to his people, and he's uh, he's addressing something, and he's saying, yeah, you're if you're poor, if you're mournful, if you're meek, if you're merciful, this is the essence of blessedness, and how he got people to listen to him is uh, is um, or how he presented his his uh, his message this way was to draw people to hear him. So you're listening to the Grace Hour. We do have our first caller on our morning program today. It's 11:30 Eastern Time in the U.S. Uh, Mike calling from Baltimore. You are on the Grace Hour. Welcome. Hello, sir. Awesome message this morning. Um, I was studying Ezekiel 8:12 uh, and uh, going over the message last night by Pastor Shabelli, where he spoke about uh, encourager, inquirer, and receiver. And 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 in Ezekiel 8:12, it uh, is talking about uh, chambers of imagery. You know how the secret in our subconscious mind, if we're allowed. Uh, if we allow it to uh, remain there. But the whole thing that we need to do is we need to focus on God's love and claim it and live in the power of that love in order to be able to uh, rid ourselves of uh, the the uh, empowering. We'll never get rid of it completely, but uh, uh, we'll give uh, more power to God than to the devil in our subconscious mind. Is this... Uh, Correct. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're we're talking about a particular piece of scripture here on our show, uh, but I, I think what you're saying is right. There is like, and I think Jesus. If you go through the Sermon on the Mount, you see that Jesus starts talking about uh, the depth of problems in people's hearts, where he gets to, you know, when you get later in chapter five, anger and lust, and those chambers of imagery are a part of every heart. You know, so uh, that's your, you know, you got to see the poverty that are there. I mean, now Ezekiel uh, is, again, a particular prophet directing his messages from the Lord to a particular situation, right? We can draw, right? We, we have to look at that context, and then we can make our own spiritual conclusions for our own life, right, Pastor Love? We yeah. just want to be uh, clear about that. Yep. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Yep. Uh, we're going to go to Port Chester, New York now, and we're going to take Lauren's call. Lauren, you were on the Grace Hour. Hi, Lauren. Lauren, are you there? Somehow we okay. aren't connecting. Well, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll get to the bottom of that. We, you know, uh, these are all, you know, phone lines are interesting now, uh, you know, you know, I have a landline at my house now that's not a landline, which is kind of interesting. They just put a little router in my house, and now the copper wire that used to come into my house is no longer active. So it still comes to my house, but no signal comes down to it. So it's kind of into technology can get interfered with. Lauren, call back, yeah. and we'll get you back on the air. And uh, what was I? What were you we talking about? When, uh, well, I want to go back to something you mentioned, Pastor yeah. Steve, and that is, uh, again, you know, you could say, you could make this statement that much of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount is legal mm -hmm. in its character and its teachings. Uh, but again, I think that he, he did that purposefully because he wanted to take the law, which we know no man could fulfill. The law wasn't given so that anyone would be made righteous. The law was given so that we would recognize just how sinful we were and yeah. hopefully, you know, cry out for <laughs> deliverance and, and for a savior, for a Messiah to come. So, but he did say, I, I haven't come, you know, uh, to, to do away with it. I've come to establish it, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul said he did in Romans, the 10th chapter. You know, he fulfilled all of the righteous requirements under the law for our sake, because mm -hmm. we couldn't fulfill the requirements of the law. All we could do is to break those laws, but God came so Christ would, again, be the fulfillment of the law and then be able to extend grace towards sinful people on the basis of a fulfilled law. That's true. 
Amen. Well, I think we got Lauren back. Do we have Lauren back uh, from New York? Lauren, welcome. Yeah, thanks for thanks for taking me back. You know, when I read that, when you know, when one reads that Sermon on the Mount, you get the feeling like like that leper in Matthew chapter mm-hmm. eight. Uh, Lord, Lord, yeah, thou can cleanse me if thou that will. You know. Yeah, I guess that's. I remember. The... Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to going to say I remember reading the Sermon on the Mount for the first time in the summer. Of, ni- of 1971, I was in Canterbury, England. I, I had just bought my first New Testament. And then uh, I had heard Billy Graham on TV a number of times. And then I think, it, yeah, it was January or February 1972. That was the first time I asked Jesus Christ to be to be my personal Savior as, uh, in light of what, I'm, what we're discussing this morning. Mm. So this is, I think, uh, okay, let's, let's get a little... Greek lesson. We know gnosis is the is like a root form of knowledge, and there is diagnosis, which it seems like the Sermon on the Mount is like a diagnosis. The great physician has entered the room, and he's starting to show us the problems. Like you said, you felt like the leper, and the leper's response was, I'm unclean. I have to tell everyone I'm unclean. I can look at my skin and see the disaster of the fall of Adam in my very body. And Jesus, will you make me free from this disease? And Jesus says, I will. And I think like, so diagnosis is one thing. And then there is epignosis, which is, uh, well, Pastor Love, how would you define epignosis? Um, my understanding is that it's, it's, it's uh, like an internal understanding, yeah. a deeper understanding within the soul, within the spirit. Yeah. Of an individual, it's the it's the uh, yeah the diagnosis shows us what's wrong. Epignosis takes us to like a it's an above knowledge. It's God's knowledge being communicating to us, and and we get wisdom that way. So uh, I think that's what Jesus is saying. Here's the diagnosis of the condition, even among my chosen people, because you said this is a kingdom teaching. We've said that this is a kingdom teaching. Jesus is addressing primarily Jewish followers of his right now and he's taking the law and he's saying you have heard it said this way and i'm telling you this way and uh, apparently uh you know when we see the conversations that jesus had when they talk about rich men not being able to enter the kingdom the idea of being poor and mournful and uh and persecuted was not their idea of blessedness exactly yeah right wealth meant blessing, yeah, right? I mean, wealth meant blessing. So if you were being blessed materially, financially, that was a sign that God <laughs> had blessed you. So for yeah. Jesus to come and turn the tables as he did and yep. say, blessed are the poor, yeah, well, come on. But think about it, that, that principle of James chapter two, verse five, uh, hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? and heirs of the kingdom. Now, what is he saying there? He's not talking about those that are poverty-stricken financially or materialistically. He's talking about poverty of spirit. And that is a place that everyone has to reach or get to before they recognize their need for Christ. That's it. That's awesome. Yep. Did we lose Lauren? Okay, Lauren, you still there? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I was was just listening to what you were were saying. Yeah, that's fine. I just said... Your name sort of dropped off our call list here, so go ahead. Uh, so any, anyhow, what happened? So what happens is, is like, isn't it interesting that the very one of the very very first things that Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount are is blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, in other words, uh, before you can even begin to do what I'm go- going to be teaching you, you got you got this is where you got to start out. You got to start out with total inability. I think you're right. I think the emptiness, and like you said, when you became a believer, you had uh, you felt like the leper. And I can remember just going through a very interesting progression of uh, weeks before I was uh, before I chose to give my life to Christ. And I can remember feeling very dark and lonely, and things were sort of collapsing in on me. And um, you know, it was that what you know I had gone to a traditional church, said a lot of prayers sung a lot of hymns, and uh, even gone to other kinds of churches uh, uh, over a period of time and not been brought to the sense of my poverty, my need for the Savior. And then one night, 
all of those combination of feelings and realities, uh, you know, made themselves, uh, you know, there was a weight that I had to get rid of sort of like in, uh, in Pilgrim's progress, I was carrying a load upon my back and I had to lay it down at the foot of the cross. And I think that's what uh, Jesus is addressing here. All the people that are coming to him, John the Baptist had already opened a way had prepared a way by talking about uh, people seeing their need for being clean. And uh, baptism was sort of like a demonstrative way of like expressing your need for taking a bath. And Jesus is saying, there's a deeper heart issue. I'm going to say the poverty. You're right. That's great thoughts, Lauren. Thanks for your call today. Uh, Thanks for listening and being a part of our program. I hope you enjoy the new time. All right, friends, you're listening to The Grace Hour. Pastor John Love, I'm Pastor Steve Andrelonis. This is our new time frame, 11 to 12, Monday through Friday, online. You can get us at gracehour.org. You can get us at ggwo.org, Greater Grace World Outreach. Grace Hour is an outreach of Greater Grace World Outreach. Also find us on YouTube Live and Facebook Live at this time. And if you've missed any part of the program, remember... We archive this, gracehour.org, and also Apple, Spotify, Amazon, iHeart, Pandora, Audible, Google, and Stitcher. All those places you can find us, and uh, you can re-listen to the program if you you have missed any part of our discussion. And uh, we are doing our best to, like, uh, be a little prepared, a little better prepared for you, and uh, bring you uh, some some themes and things. And uh, so this week, uh, Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about Jesus. And then next week, of course, we'll get into the uh, run-up to Easter and all that's happening. So uh, we should tell you, as usual, at Greater Grace in Baltimore, our Easter season includes a a great dramatic presentation, the Easter play. And uh, you'll want to be a part of that. Uh, GGWO.org has some details about it, and uh, I'm showing you this. If you're looking, you can see I'm showing you this uh, this piece of uh, literature. And uh, the play will be April 12th. That's a Tuesday. And then also Thursday, Friday, Saturday, April 14th, 15th, and 16th, 7 p.m. Come and see this production. Uh, it really talks about uh, the people who were affected by the ministry of Jesus. And it's, uh, it's, it's dramatic. It's musical. It's powerful, it's biblical, and there's some humor thrown in just to keep you off base there. Anyway, so uh, come and see the Easter play at Greater Grace Church in Baltimore. Back to New York we go. Caitlin, you are on the Grace Hour. Hi, Caitlin. Hello, how are you? Awesome. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, I just think that this is a beautiful theme um, leading up to uh, Palm Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thank you for uh, sharing this. And um, a lot of what I had thought about um, concerning the Beatitudes was uh, Jesus. I, I've been going through a little bit of Proverbs, and a lot of that has to deal with the condition of our heart. And um A lot of time you hear like, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit and um, an unsaved person or somebody that hasn't um, looked at those scriptures without looking at the Old Testament scriptures can easily, I know I have, think of the fact that I, that I need to become poor and I need to rent and like ashes on my head, Mm -hmm. but it has to do with the condition of the um, heart in the spiritual sense that um, God wants us to come to him with, um, I think, just an, an open canvas, yeah. per an, se. A, an empty and, soul, right? Yeah. 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 Or, or, or a soul, um, not even just an empty soul, but a soul ready that's ready to hear, because sometimes uh, the Pharisees or the... Uh, um, Israel would come with their own ideas, like mm-hmm. the Samaritans had their own way of doing, um, performing the the Torah, um, performing the law, and um, the there was many different sects of them. Some of them were divided for long periods of time before the Babylonian age, and um, more arguing than they would be looking 
Caitlin, are you there still? We, we must have a bad connection. Uh, I guess you were, we could hear you and then you're, you kind of cut out on us. So maybe try to reconnect with us. But I think she's uh, taken us in a good direction, Pastor yeah. Steve, because, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, there's only two kinds of religion in the world, right? Mm -hmm. One says something in my hands I bring. <laughs> yeah. The other one is nothing in my yeah. hands I bring, but simply to thy cross I cling. And I think she's trying to describe the fact that, you know, whether it's the Old Testament or prior to the work of Christ on the cross, him laying down his life and dying for us, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. No matter what we try to produce for God, no matter how we try to live our lives with the hope that they'll, they'll be found acceptable in his sight, it doesn't measure up. Yeah, Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. And if you don't see yourself poverty stricken as far as righteousness goes, then you're just going to stay on that path. And you, you're going to, you're going to live with this idea, this mentality that God is interested in good people. And if you're not good, do everything you can to develop that goodness, because it's that goodness alone that's going to make you right in God's sight. And that's not the gospel. The just shall live by faith. And that's, you know, Habakkuk 2, 4. And Paul used that in three different contexts in his letters to just really show that it's faith in the Son of God that is really the active thing. Now, you introduced it. Like, we're not, we don't see faith in the Spirit in this teaching. Mm -hmm. But we know that Jesus spoke in many parables. And, uh, you know, when Jesus was speaking, you know, he said, some see and some hear. I mean, the words fall upon their ears, the sights fall upon their eyes, and they don't comprehend because they don't, they're not ready. They're not empty enough to receive this. The leper, as uh, Lauren graphically said, like he was like a leper, the leper knew his need. Jesus, make me well. And even the demoniac, even as, as full of demons as he was, something brought him to the shore and said, why are you here? What are you coming to me for? And uh, so we know that some people who pile up these levels of, of legal, whatever, legal, uh, legal activity, whatever, you know, they can pile up this thing and say, here, God, you owe me, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, because that's, that's the nature of man. He wants to find himself, you know, making a good deal with God. And if I live in such and such, it's kind of like the rich young ruler approaching Jesus yes. saying, what must I do? to inherit eternal life. And, and Jesus said to him, well, you know what the law says. Yes, uh, yes, I've kept the law from my youth. And, and I think Pastor Shallow brought it out recently in a message. Then, then why are you asking? In other words, if by keeping the law you could be made righteous, mm -hmm. why are you asking me how to inherit eternal life? Because the law doesn't make you righteous. In fact, yeah. the law was given, if for any reason, it was to show us our utter sinfulness and our need for something beyond the law for salvation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he, he sets the whole sermon up with these, this blessed, this series of what we've called the Beatitudes, uh, and, but then, you know, and then he starts deconstructing a lot of the way people are thinking, you know. Okay, you're listening to The Grace Hour. It's 1148 here in Baltimore. We have George on the uh, line from Baltimore. We'll take George, and then we'll get back to uh, Caitlin in a moment. George, go ahead. Hey, uh, Pastor Love, Pastor Angelonis. Uh, yeah, this is really, really good subject. Uh, you know what I like about it is it's like Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount is like it's the, you know, most of the people were under the law, used to being under the law, and here's his first lesson and how to live the normal Christian life. What the things you will do, you know, it's really, you know, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. You know, just all the different things he goes through. And, and, and it goes totally against, you, you know, what they've been brought up with, you know, and it's meant to release them unto a whole new victorious life, you know, and in, in, in Christ. And, and it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing thing when you look at it, you know, when you think of it, how, how deep it is and, and, and how powerful 
everything that is said, and, it, and, and like you have brought up in the beginning about how there's no talk of uh, salvation, faith, this, that, you know, it's just going through everything. But it's because the people have been under the law so long, and now it needs to be addressed with this type of teaching, and here you have the normal Christian life. It's amazing. Yeah, it, it, He takes it, don't you think, George, that he takes it to another level? Yes. I mean, in other words, if, if anybody is thinking, yes, I have attempted to keep the law throughout my whole life. Well, Jesus said, well, uh, you know, congratulations, but this is what the law, this is the spirit behind the law. This is what God is really looking for. And I think it was Caitlin earlier who said, these principles that Jesus is bringing out addresses the heart. And the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious leaders of his day were so occupied with the outward appearance that they had lost sight completely of what was happening on the inside. Amen. Yeah, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It is so true. And, uh, you know, I love what Caitlin was saying and what she was bringing out, you know, is this really, really good. And it, it, that that's it. It's the issues, the issues of the heart, and they needed to be addressed. And he, he addressed them right there. And, and it's just each, you know, each verse as you go through it, it's, it's so power-packed, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, yeah. They must have been, when you when we try to put ourselves in their places, you know, thinking about being under the law and then hearing that, it had to be so radical to them, right? Sure, <laughs> sure. Yeah, 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 well, yeah. Well, well, think about it. The end of the Sermon on the Mount, the end of Matthew chapter 7, it, this is what we read. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. I think that's like saying mission accomplished, yes. Matthew said, because if the people are astonished, that's precisely where Jesus wanted to have them. It's like everything you've heard before, you know, you have to now think of it in the context of who I am Mm. and uh, I'm the son of man and I've come to say some things. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Uh, uh, Do we have Caitlin still there? Okay. Caitlin, we're sorry. Uh, You slipped away from us. All right. Thanks George uh, for your call. We're going to go to uh, York, Pennsylvania and uh, pastor Duke. Thanks for all the calls today. We're going to try to get to everyone, uh, but uh, we're taking them in order here. Pastor Duke, go ahead. Hi, Pastor Steve, Pastor Love. Wow, what an amazing uh, message. I just wanted to say that um, when I went to NBCNS and um, was learning, you know, took New Testament survey, and then I took your class, Pastor Love, on the Gospels and uh, got amazing insight on the context of the Gospels and Matthew being written a lot of people don't understand that Matthew was written to, like Pastor Steve said earlier, Jewish believers, Mm -hmm. and they were questioning whether or not Jesus was really the Messiah because they were expecting the kingdom to come, as you said, Pastor Love. They didn't understand that later on in Matthew's Gospel in chapter 12, when they basically as a nation rejected Christ as the Messiah, That's when the postponement of the kingdom occurred in the gospel there. And now, later on in Matthew 16, he he mentions the first time the church, and that was the mystery not understood in the Old Testament scriptures. So I'm going to Bible college and learning the context of the gospels. It really opens up all the teachings in Matthew's gospel specifically, when you know that he was writing to them because they were wondering, you know, okay. And you know what's amazing? If you talk to a Jew today, many times they stumble because they're saying, well, if Jesus was the Messiah, then where's the kingdom? Mm -hmm. They don't understand that it was postponed because they rejected their king, the Messiah, and the kingdom will come later And that's, you know, Matthew 24 talks about, you know, Jesus coming back in his second advent. So your teaching today, Pastor Love, it's so phenomenal, and it's so, 
you know, you mentioned rightly dividing the word. It is so amazing and so rightly divided today. And I just want to encourage people listening, if you uh, are looking for a Bible college, pray about Maryland Bible College and Seminary. You will be tremendously blessed. Amen. Uh, Thanks, Pastor. Great thoughts. Uh, You're listening to the Grace Hour. Thank you, Pastor Duke uh, from York, Pennsylvania. You're listening to the Grace Hour. Uh, Just a couple of of our Facebook Live comments here. Uh, uh, The question on the Sermon of the Forest, do you know? I I think she means the Sermon on the Mount. Oh, the Sermon on the Mount. I would guess. So that's Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. Yeah, Yeah, so that's what that is. Uh, uh, Also, let's see here. Um, Worry. Uh, God bless you, Pastor Love and Pastor Steve, for your faithfulness to these messages you have taught us. And uh, what is here? Uh, sonship is a reflection. Uh, God has made us an heir. That's from a Tofik, uh, beautiful believer from Palestine, now living in Budapest. And he has a great story. Tofik, you should call. You should tell us your story. You should share your story one day of uh, getting out of Ukraine, a uh, 21-hour train trip, all that kind of thing, and uh, it's amazing, and he was at uh, Eurocon. Okay, it's uh, 11.56, we got a couple minutes. Uh, Shirley, you got two minutes. Wonderful. You know, I just want to say, gentlemen, Pastor Love, congratulations. You're back on AM. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And we're enjoying it. Yeah. Hey, I was in the Duncan, and uh, it was good because... Um, I got to witness to a policeman and four four guys from Nepal. But uh, um, I didn't hear the message, but I just want to say I, I that for prayer for the play, you know, stay small and pray big. And my desire and my hope is, God, could there be five salvations every night, ten salvations, God, fifteen mm. salvations every night? Well, that's my prayer, and I just want to say I hope. You know, whatever. But we're all praying and believing God that it's going to be amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Shirley. Yep. So here we are. Play flyers. You can come to Greater Grace Church of Baltimore and get some of these and pass them out uh, all throughout uh, Baltimore City. It's got a little track on the back there. Uh, you could do that. It's amazing. Well, we want to thank everyone for joining us at 11 o'clock today. Uh, Evie, thank you for your question. How to Help a Christian Who's Always Been Taught Conditional Salvation to Break Free from It. I think uh, the Holy Spirit has to do that. And uh, maybe tomorrow, Pastor Love will be on the air. Uh, I think he's on the air with uh, Pastor Wright. And uh, it'll be awesome. They could uh, attack that question for you. Friends, we want to thank you for being a part of the Grace Hour online today. We're on 11 to 12 every morning, Monday through Friday from now on. Thanks for being a part of the Grace Hour uh, for Pastor Love. For Sebastian Palmieri, our engineer today, I'm Pastor Steve Andrelonis. Have a great afternoon. It's coming up in two minutes.